This is VOA. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. It's Tuesday, June 4th. This is Africa 54. Human rights groups worry about what they say are crackdowns targeting Zimbabwean activists. The Sudanese military calls for snap elections amid continuing protests to hand over power to a civilian administration. And with life-saving surgery for a mother and daughter from Zanzibar, an Israeli NGO fixes two generations of heart defects. We begin tonight in Southern Africa, where there's a growing concern in Zimbabwe by rights organizations over what they say is a crackdown by the government of President Emerson Nangagwa against opposition activists. This side of seven activists were detained upon returning from home from a conference in the Maldives. Rights groups fear the government is adopting the same hardline tactics used by former President Robert Mugabe. Columbus Mavunga reports from Harare. Makombororo Razivesha leaves Zimbabwe's maximum security prison where he was visiting the seven detained activists who are being held on treason charges. He is a family friend of one of them, 37-year-old Tatenda Mombiarara. It's a baseless charge. It's just a, a charge which they are using to justify uh, the crackdown on human rights defenders and civil society in Zimbabwe. But the reality on the ground is uh, the economy is in tatters. Timbers within the country are high. So the government now, in order to throw fear, to intimidate the people into uh, uh, pacific, to pacify them, they are going for uh, opposition people, they are going for uh, leading civil society uh, organizations and uh, top human rights defenders in order to, one, to pacify them in case of any planned uh, peaceful uh, mass action. Zimbabwe's Justice Minister Ziambe Ziambe has told VOA that the government will not comment on the allegation because the matter is before the court. The seven were arrested last month at Arades International Airport as they returned from attending a workshop in the Maldives. Prosecutors accused the seven of traveling to the Maldives for training in tactics to topple the government. If found guilty, they could be sentenced to up to 20 years in prison. Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights is hopeful that the High Court will release them on bail. Uh, we believe that um, uh, these people did not commit any crime or any offense. Uh, according to Zimbabwe's law, uh, they enjoy uh, several of their fundamental rights and we believe that this is just one case of the several cases which we have seen a couple of years of the government um, uh, going down on the work of civil society. Arresting opposition figures was a common tactic used by long-time President Robert Mugabe during his 38 years in power, which ended in 2017. Groups like Human Rights Watch now accuse President Emerson Munangagwa of resorting to the same tactic as public anger at the failing economy grows stronger. Columbus Mavunga for VOA News, Harare. Sudan's military leaders have made an abrupt reversal, deciding to cancel what they had previously agreed to with protesters about uh, the country's transition and called for elections within nine months, according to General Abdel Fattah al-Burhani. Al-Burhani says the election will take place under, quote, regional and international supervision. Monday's announcement came after Sudan's military forcibly broke up a week-long sit-in outside Khartoum's army headquarters that left more than 30 people dead. Demonstrators want a quick handover of power to a civilian administration. A spokesman for UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says he condemned the actions of the Sudanese security forces. 
and he is alarmed by reports that security forces have opened fire inside medical facilities. The Secretary General reminds the Transitional Military Council of its responsibility for the safety and security of the citizens of Sudan. He urges all parties to act with the utmost restraint. Protest organizers have suspended further talks with the Transitional Military Council and called for civil disobedience across the country until the military hands over power to civilians. The UN Secretary General also called on Sudanese authorities to conduct an independent investigation and hold people accountable for the sit-in deaths. Meanwhile, the United Nations Rights Agency spokeswoman Ravina Shamdasani on Tuesday called on Sudanese security forces to halt attacks on Khartoum protest camps and allow for negotiations for a transition to civilian-led power to continue. Instead of targeting the protest leaders, we call on the Transitional Military Council to reach out to them again for a renewed negotiation and a discussion about how to manage the transition um, of Sudan to a civilian-led administration. The human rights grievances that led to the protest in the first place will not go away if the military simply decides to impose its own election schedule. There needs to be a discussion about the grievances that sparked the protest in the first place if any transition in Sudan is to be sustainable and peaceful. The UN agency says that the human rights grievances that led to the protest in the first place will not go away if the military simply decides to impose its own election schedule. Now, Cameroon's forest tribes have long depended on insects to supplement their diets. The palm weevil grub, a fat worm found in palm trees, is such a popular source of protein that it has quammed from the forest into the villages and even urban restaurants. Moki Edwin Kinzeka has this report narrated by Anne Nzuankeu in Yaounde. In Cameroon's capital, some unusual ingredients are wiggling into city kitchens. At Le Cycle Municipal Restaurant, Chef Emil Engulu cooks palm weevil grubs to create dishes of international standard. They are the best protein that exists. We have not even finished making an inventory of all of the benefits we obtain by eating the palm tree worms. For people used to eating meat and fish, finding worms in a plate of food can be a shock. But the palm weevil grub can also be a pleasant surprise. The service is very well done. It's well prepared. We're enjoying it. I hadn't seen this way of cooking yet, but this is great. The high demand from chefs has led to short supplies of palm weevil grubs. But villagers who used to gather the grubs in the forest see it as an opportunity to farm the worms for restaurants. When we raise worms in the village, it is less painful, it is more profitable, and here you spend less energy. People eat palm weevil in other African countries and in South America and Southeast Asia. The growing popularity of the grub in Cameroon has made it several times more expensive than meat. When we do gastronomy in Cameroon, we need authentic, natural, organic, and precious ingredients. And I often like to say that the palm tree worm is the equivalent in Africa of caviar in Europe. As its reputation grows in restaurants, the palm weevil grub also remains a popular food in Cameroon's villages and markets. For Anne-Mireille Zwanke Moki, Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yaoundé. The huge Smithsonian institution is soon getting a new leader, the first insider and African-American. Lonnie Bunch, the founding director of the Smithsonian's popular National Museum of African-American History and Culture here in Washington, D.C., will become the new secretary on June 16th. He is VOA's Deborah Block. The founding director of the Smithsonian Museum about African American history will become the 14th secretary to lead the world's largest museum, education, and research complex. 
As the head of 19 museums and the National Zoo, Bunch called the move humbling and exciting and said his time at the African American Museum will serve him well. It is something that had never crossed my mind to do, but it also makes me feel good because I get to give back to the institution I care the most about, the Smithsonian. Bunch has served in three Smithsonian museums where he says he has touched upon all aspects of the Smithsonian. Traditionally, the secretaries of the Smithsonian have been scientists from outside the organization. Bunch said he was pleased that an insider like himself, who is a historian and curator, was selected. I wasn't even sure when they asked me to, to you know, go for this job that they'd hire somebody like me, mm -hmm. that they'd hire an insider. But it was the Museum about African American history that thrust him at the forefront, building it from the ground up and opening it in 2016. We felt it was crucial to craft a museum that would help America remember and confront, confront its tortured racial past. Another Smithsonian Museum is also dedicated to a minority group, the Native American. Kevin Gover, the head of the museum, says Bunch has impeccable credentials and he is pleased to see a person of color in charge of all the museums. It is momentous that the Smithsonian for the first time has at the, at the head of the organization a person of color. It's been a very, um, in some ways, conservative and very white institution in its leadership throughout, throughout its existence. Well, my whole career has been about kicking down doors and breaking ceilings and trying to help people understand that both African-American culture and African-Americans are central to who we are as Americans. My hope is that this will um, give people a sense of optimism and hope. Gover says he expects the new secretary will continue to find ways to connect the diversity among the various museums. We are experts here at my museum on the Native American perspective. Um, but if we tell a story uh, without considering the African-American perspective or the, the European-American perspective or the Asian-American perspective, we have not done as complete a job as we should have. Bunch says no matter what happens, the Smithsonian will always be that place to help us understand a diverse America. Deborah Block, VOA News, Washington. Muslims worldwide are marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan. Here are some wishes from those celebrating Eid in Somalia. Well, this cannot describe how happy I am today. I share happiness with all Muslim people around the world, particularly Somali people. And I can say this is the best Eid that we have never seen. And I say congratulations to all Muslims around the world. I would like to congratulate the Somali people across the world on the occasion of Eid and I wish them all the best. May Allah bless you and bless your homes and your families and your beloved ones. Uh, we, uh, I hope for the Somali people everywhere in the world, uh, much prosperity, happiness, forgiveness, and God is blessing. I wish you all the best and I pray God bless you all wherever you are. Those who are some of the Muslims celebrating Eid in Somalia. Now, U.S. Border Patrol agents assigned to the Eagle Pass, Texas station apprehended a group of 37 undocumented immigrants from Central Africa on Saturday, according to the Del Rio Sector Chief Patrol Agent Raul Ortiz. On June 1st, agents performing line watch operations arrested a group of 37 undocumented immigrants from the Republic of the Congo and the Democratic Republic of Congo after they illegally entered the United States by crossing the Rio Grande River. The group was composed almost entirely of family units, including several small children. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, the link between premature birth and heart disease. We'll be right back.
Gigi. Bantu. Arabic. It is the beat. The African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct. And adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. I am Sheikha Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. Starring by Ted Gibson in West Hollywood, California, has turned the traditional hair salon model upside down, creating a place where trim meets tech. Celebrity stylist Ted Gibson boasts a client list that includes Lupita Nyong'o. Clients get their hair done in one of five semi-private pods called clouds. These allow for privacy and are meant to replace the bustling hair salon where rows of people are lined up staring in the same mirror. The pods are equipped with an Amazon Fire tablet, an Amazon video application, and Sonos smart speakers, which allow clients to shop, order products from the salon, ask Alexa to change the music and ambient lighting, and watch movies. Next up, among the exhibits being presented here at the annual conference of the American Alliance of Museums is new technology designed to help the blind see art and pictures. Members of the National Federation of the Blind were among those in New Orleans to try out the three-dimensional images on display that featured raised subjects, varying textures and audio accompaniments. Various displays included a war scene, musical art painting, and historical paintings. Also on display, a more functional example of the technology's use, a university campus map. And that's what's trending today. British Prime Minister Theresa May and U.S. President Donald Trump held a brief press conference Tuesday following their bilateral talks in London. Trump and First Lady Melania arrived at the Prime Minister's residence at number 10 Downing Street Tuesday, where they were greeted by May and posed for pictures. The two had met earlier in the day at a business roundtable where both leaders expressed confidence they could arrive at substantial trade deal. Meanwhile, across London, thousands of protesters had a much less friendly greeting for the visiting president. Demonstrators carried signs and led anti-Trump chants, while the now infamous giant inflatable Trump baby floated nearby. Both May and Trump say Britain and the United States could expand their economic partnership with a bilateral trade deal. Trump is pursuing new trade arrangements with a number of major U.S. trade partners, including China, with a stated goal of making terms more friendly to the United States. President Trump enjoyed pomp and pageantry on the first day of his state visit to Britain, where Queen Elizabeth hosted a royal banquet for him at Buckingham Palace. Yet Trump waded into controversy with comments on Brexit and perceived insults of London Mayor Sadiq Khan. VOA White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara reports from London. A royal welcome for President Donald Trump on his state visit to Britain by Her Majesty the Queen. The day of pageantry included an inspection of the Guard of Honor and laying a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier in Westminster Abbey as part of 75 years remembrance of D-Day. Ending the day with a royal state banquet. Of course, it is not only our security which unites us, but our strong cultural links and shared heritage. To the eternal friendship of our people, the vitality of our nations, and to the long-cherished and truly remarkable reign 
of Her Majesty the Queen. Where Trump's adult children were also invited. State visits are supposed to be about pomp and pageantry, but even before he arrived at Buckingham Palace, President Trump has waded into diplomatic complications, offering remarks on the touchy subject of Brexit, including voicing support for Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage, potentially bringing even more embarrassment to Prime Minister Theresa May, who will be resigning in just a few days. May is leaving after failing to negotiate a Brexit deal that Parliament could ratify. Trump called on Britain to leave the EU without a deal if Brussels refuses to meet its demands. President Trump has given his wholehearted support for Brexit and for a US-UK free trade deal. Uh, and so this is a big priority issue. Trump is backing Boris Johnson as Britain's next prime minister. Britain seemed to have mixed feelings about Trump's remarks. Well, personally, I view Boris Johnson as a little bit of a muppet. So that I understand why Trump likes someone like Boris Johnson. So I don't think there's a problem with him commenting uh, about what's going on, and we probably should get our act together, but it's absolutely fine. I just think he's a breath of fresh air against politicians who generally are asked a question and never give an answer. Still, Trump's remarks have unsettled the carefully calibrated pageantry, including his insults of London Mayor Sadiq Khan, whom he called a stone-cold loser. Khan hit back with an editorial describing Trump as a global threat. Friendship means candor, and I think we should be candid with uh, the, America, the American president saying, you know what, we disagree with you on so many things. Khan has also allowed the Trump baby to fly over London Tuesday as part of the massive protests being planned for the president's second day in Britain. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News, London. It's time for our health report. And joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu with the latest on Ebola outbreak again in Democratic Republic of mm, That's right, right, Esther. And the goods, not so good. Yeah. The, the, the number of reported Ebola cases in the Democratic Republic of Congo has exceeded the, the threshold of 2,000, according to the World Health Organization. Speaking to the media in Switzerland Tuesday, WHO spokesman Tariq Jasserich called the situation a quote sad and frustrating milestone a key part of the Ebola response effort involves decontaminating health facilities educating health workers on how to protect themselves and their parents and persuading residents to seek treatment at specialized as centers but insecurity in the region is undermining efforts to contain the outbreak since the beginning of the outbreak, there were 2,008 cases, uh, including 1,346 deaths. Uh, so, for example, yesterday there was a, there was a seven new cases being uh, being detected. The day before, it was it was more than that. If we can't get access to communities, we are not able to to do those services, and then obviously uh, that's a that's opportunity for the virus to to, to spread in a more intense way. We know that we have uh, tools at our disposal. Uh, we, um, we have strategies that we know that are working. Uh, but again, if we cannot deploy those tools, uh, it is, it is, we can't expect that uh, that outbreak uh, will, be, will be contained. This is Congo's 10th Ebola outbreak but is the first in the densely populated provinces of North Kivu and Ituri. Now, a new study suggests that babies who are born too soon may be more likely to develop heart disease as adults than full-term infants. For the study published in the medical journal JAMA Pediatrics, researchers examined data on more than 2 million babies born in Sweden between 1973 and 1994. They followed them through 2015 to see how many develop heart disease. Adults who were born before 37 weeks gestation were 53% more likely to develop heart disease than people who were full-term babies, according to the researchers. People who were born just a little bit earlier at 37 to 38 weeks gestation were 19% more likely to develop heart disease. 
and researchers say the findings were not explained by maternal factors or risk factors as shared within families such as heart disease or hypertension and were more likely from direct effects of preterm birth. A team of Israeli doctors have repaired the heart of a toddler from Zanzibar two decades after the very same charity repaired her mother's heart. 26-year-old Balkis Samai Silma has arrived in Israel with her one-year-old daughter Fatma. Fatma is one of 15 children who has been diagnosed by Save a Child's Heart Medical Mission in Zanzibar and sent to Israel to undergo surgery at Wolfson Medical Center. 20 years ago, the very same charity repaired Fatma's mother's heart. I did not expect this one. It was my surprise when I got to the hospital there. Your baby has also a problem. I got shock. Oh. Dr. Lior Sasson is Sever Child's heart lead surgeon. He operated on Fatma and as an intern also took part in Balkis' operation in 1999. We have a unique uh, patient uh, today, actually a former patient and uh, a current patient. Um, Dr. Ami Cohen operated the mother 20, 20 years ago while she was six years of age and he closed the hole inside her heart. Uh, and it's very exciting uh, for us as surgeons, medical team, uh, to see how patients uh, continue their life after the surgery. Founded in 1995, the team of doctors from the Israeli NGO repair congenital heart defects for children like Fatma from developing countries worldwide, mainly in Africa and the Middle East. Fatma, who was born with a congenital heart disease, was operated on at Wolfson Hospital mm -hmm. earlier than expected due to the severity okay. of a condition. We closed the, um, a big hole between the two vessels of uh, the great arteries. It went very successful and uh, we are very happy. Fatma's successful surgery makes her number 5,000 of the children saved by the organization. Heartwarming there. Well, that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Moudou. Esther. Thank you again, Lino, for another wonderful health report. Thank you. All right. Be sure to watch Lino Moudou's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.